The Sports Town Podcast. All right, I'm pleased to be joined by Chris Brown from Sports Talk with Chris. How's it going, Chris? Oh, it's going great, man. How you doing? I'm doing all right. Of course, the big talk right now, the NBA playoffs. Um, let's first start off with you said you were a Sixers fan before we started recording. Uh, yes. They got a big win last night, which at the time of the recording, it's Wednesday so or Thursday. Um, what did you think about the Sixers' performance against the Wizards on Wednesday night? It was dominant. It was everything I looked for. You know, a lot of people, for some reason, was calling out Ben Simmons in game one because he only had six points, but they failed to realize he had 15 assists, 15 rebounds, and he made life really difficult for Bradley Bill, which for me is the biggest takeaway. So in this game, he came out ultra aggressive. He had 16 points in the first half. And for me, he really set the tone for the entire game, being aggressive, being a domino of defense, and crashing the boards. And honestly, that's how the game, you know, went. It was really dominant. For me, the Wizards had no chance. The score would be close, but they were never able to break away because key guys just had bad games. You know, Bradley Bill did his thing which is fine, but Russell Westbrook, you know, he ended up getting injured, but he was struggling throughout the entire game. And then one of their other best players, David Bertans, he ended up fouling out. He didn't have a productive game at all. So I feel like the Philadelphia 76ers just came out and they showed their dominance and showed why they're the number one seed in the Eastern Conference. Yeah, Ben Simmons is kind of that player that does a lot of it. He's not the best scorer in the world, and of course mm-hmm. he's not the best shooter, but he kind of does everything else really good. Like he's a great rebounder. He's a great assist. He, or he's just great with all that stuff. He's a great defensive player. He's probably going to get defensive player of the year. I hope so. <laughs> um, speaking of defensive player, it seems like he's going to win it. Do you think that there's a chance that he doesn't get the award? I, I want to be surprised. You know, everything when it comes to the awards is about the media's, you know, perception. So if the media is going with one guy, that's who's going to end up getting the award. Like Steph Curry got a lot of media love. And he ended up being a finalist, which I personally don't agree on. And so I see the media really loving Rudy Gobert. So I wouldn't be surprised if they ended up giving it to Rudy Gobert. What I think the easiest, and I think by far the best choice, should be Ben Simmons because of his defensive versatility. Yeah, he's done a lot, and I think he's I think he's one of the better defensive point guards in the league. And I guess if mm-hmm. Rudy Gobert doesn't win it, he'll probably cry, but <laughs> we'll, <laughs> we'll see what happens there. Um, let's start off, well, let's see. Uh, let's go a little more into the Philly and Washington game. Russell Westbrook mm-hmm. was quite upset last night, had a, had a disappointing game. He left the game with an injury. Uh, what did you think about his performance on uh, Wednesday I mean, night? It, it was a bad performance, and I'm not surprised. We have a lot of defensive guys in Philly, you know, so I, I expected Russell Westbrook to kind of struggle. You let him shoot jumpers if he comes into the paint. We have a lot of big bodies down there, so it's going to be hard for him to get going. I think the best, you know, defensive matchup for him is to have Danny Green on it because Danny Green can't move with him laterally. But just speaking on Russell Westbrook, for all Philly fans out there, I apologize because the dumping of the popcorn is something that – Philly fans, you know, we we get labeled as toxic, which, you know, <laughs> I can't be mad at because we are toxic at times, but that was just totally disrespectful, and we we don't stand with that fan. Even though Russell Westbrook had a bad game, you know, and we encourage that because we want to win a series. I don't wish injuries upon nobody. The fact that they dumped popcorn on a guy that was already down from injury, down for having a bad game, I think is inexcusable. But on his performance, I mean, I'm glad he had a bad performance. And we have so many defensive guys that only one guy, because he's a three-level scorer and Bradley Bill is able to go off this series. Yeah, it's not a good look, but, you know, hope, we hope Russell Westbrook comes back from it. Oh, yes. um, he's a great point guard. I think he's still an elite guard. Um, he's still one of the better players, and I still think he's a future Hall of Famer. Well, first um, ballot. Yeah, let's go to the next series. Of course, Brooklyn and Boston. It seems like Brooklyn's gonna kind of gonna sweep the Celtics because mm-hmm. they looked unstoppable game one and game two. Do you think there's any chance for Boston to come up top in uh, this series? There's no chance for Boston at all. I, I predicted a sweep. You know, even with Jason Tatum really having two terrible games, I've never seen him play this bad in my life. Even if he somehow, you know, when it goes to Boston, has a big performance. If you have three guys in Brooklyn. You know, in game one. The big three in Brooklyn scored or assisted on 98 out of the 104 points in game one. That big three can outscore any single team. So even if Jason Tatum has a huge performance, I think the big three for Brooklyn is just too much for Boston, especially without Dylan Brown. Yeah, it's crazy how much uh, very little the Nets big three played together. I mean, that's how good they are. And I feel like the Nets are, well, I mean, the Bucs might be their biggest test, but after the Mm Bucs, they could end up just winning the NBA finals easily. And, I mean, Brooklyn is just so good, and it just it's just crazy how many games they didn't play together, and yet they're still the so best dominant. team. I know, exactly. James Harden, Kyrie Irving, Kevin Durant, and if you don't have those guys, you guys got like Joe Harris, mm-hmm. uh, Blake Griffin when he's when he's on. 
Um, let's go to the next series. Uh, this is more a little more interesting. Miami and Milwaukee. The Bucks Ooh. have played really good, and I feel like if Giannis gets this series and beats the Nets, he has a chance to get to the NBA Finals. I talked to one of my friends last week. He's a big Bucks fan. Mm-hmm. Um, he was talking about how if they can get by Brook, if they can get by Miami and Brooklyn, there's a good chance they can win it all. What do you think about the Bucks' chance to go all the way? You know, with the Bucks, I, I think it's all about matchups. You know, if they get by by Miami, which is look like they're going to do, because I, I predicted this. You know, Miami has just not been the same team this year in the playoffs. They're just showing themselves. But Brooklyn's going to be a big test. The thing I like about Milwaukee this year is the addition of Drew Holiday. For me, he's just a way better player than Eric Bledsoe. Eric Bledsoe was a good defender, but in the playoffs, that's kind of all he brought. And sometimes he was hit or miss. For me, Drew Holiday is first team on defense. He's a guy that can score on all three levels consistently, and he can close out games. So I think with bringing in a guy like Drew Holiday, you have Bobby Portis, P.J. Tucker, you know, Forbes off the bench, a lot of shooters. This team definitely has a chance. I think Brooklyn is going to be a huge test, but also Philadelphia. I don't want people to count that out. You know, we played the first time in Philly, even without Joel Embiid, we only lost about a little bit. And then, you know, the second or third game we played in Milwaukee, we barely had our entire team. So a lot of people are counting out Philadelphia, which I'm not surprised that's what they do with the Philadelphia 76ers. But we're well. Excuse me. We're walking right into the Eastern Conference Finals. You know, we're walking right there. So either Brooklyn or Milwaukee is going to have to play us, and we have home court advantage. So I don't think it's going to be a walk in the park for Milwaukee, but the addition to Drew Holiday definitely makes life easier for Giannis. It feels like the East playoffs is more interesting than it's been in a long time because almost definitely. every almost every year we usually count the West, and we don't really, really pay much attention to the East. But I feel like this year is finally – um, competitive and to where we actually are intrigued more maybe than the West, but it's, mm-hmm. it's, I think it's so wide open in the West, unlike the East, but yes, we'll see what happens there. Um, let's go to another series in the East. Uh, the Knicks and Hawks, of course, the Knicks won Ooh. on Wednesday night, super excited. Um, do you think, I think I had the Knicks winning in either six or seven. I can't remember. Mm-hmm. Um, what, who do you think wins that series? And do you think there's a chance that one of them at least makes the conference finals? Uh, I have the Knicks winning in seven. I just think they pose matchup problems for the Hawks, you know, when they're playing good basketball because the Knicks have been very inconsistent throughout, you know, the first two games, but they just have a way better bench than I think a lot of people in the playoffs do. So they can rely on that bench to score 50, 60 points because you got to have, you have guys like D rolls quickly and Burks, but you know, I think the Knicks are going to advance, but I don't think any team has no chance against my Sixers. Honestly, Thing, whoever we play, we're winning in five, six, maybe, if we decide to have an off game. But I think whatever team goes to the semifinals, they're losing to my Sixers. Yeah, and see, I, I think I have the Knicks as well winning. Um, I think the Hawks are solid, but I think at mm-hmm. the same time, they're just all shooting. And I think if you shut down their sh- – like, what happened in the second half, they went really cold – and I feel like that was a huge difference. And I feel like if the Knicks can play, I guess they're considered a grit and grind team with Coach mm-hmm. Tom Thibodeau. But I think um, I think if the Knicks can be able to shut down the Hawks from shooting the ball, and if the Hawks don't, like, you know, if they go cold, I think it's going to be an easy Knicks series. But I think this is going to, this is an interesting series because I think both teams are kind of at that same level. So in my opinion, I think the Knicks win in six or seven as well. Um, before we get to the West, let's talk about uh, Joel Embiid. Um, I think he was the favorite to win the MVP the whole time until he got hurt. Um, I think Jokic is the MVP candidate right now, but I think Embiid was the best player, again, if he didn't miss so many games. Uh, what did you think about it, and do you think Embiid still has a shot to win the MVP? You no, know, for me, in the beginning of the year, when I did my preseason predictions, I actually had Devin Booker win the MVP, but with Joel Embiid, I said, he's going to have the best year of his career, but I know he's going to miss games. Like, I already knew that in the back of my head, he was going to miss games. And, you know, throughout the regular seasons before the injury, it was like, okay, he has a chance. But then that big injury, he missed 10 plus games. I knew they was going to take it away from him. When I look at him, he had the best, you know, for me, he had the best center season. This dude went up six points per game last year. He's a defensive player of the year candidate. He does it on both ends of the court. He's super dominant. He's super efficient. So, And his team is the first seed in the East and a top five seed in the entire NBA. So I definitely think, he should definitely win it, but I'm not going to be surprised that they give it to Jokic because they're going to hold, oh, he missed this amount of games. He did this, he did that. But if you look at the dominance throughout the year, I think Joel Embiid was one of, if not the most dominant player this year. Yeah, I would I would 100% agree with you. And I think Curry's kind of at that same boat, except for his team didn't win, make even make the playoffs. But I think Joel Embiid was the best player the whole time. And I think, again, if he doesn't miss so many games, he's the MVP. Yes. Um, 
So let's go to the West now. The number one and eight, the Jazz Grizzlies. That series currently is tied 1-1. I feel like the Jazz are going to end up winning that series in five Mm -hmm. or six. But the Grizzlies have definitely fought hard and give credit to uh, what Memphis has done. Um, Do you think there's a shot that Memphis at least wins one more game? Um, There may be a shot at home. You know, I feel like they had a good game. And I just want to say shout out to John Morant because he's a guy that I've been critical of this year because if you look at it, you know, yes, he won a one point per game last year, but his field goal percentage went down, his three point percentage and free throw percentage went down. He was very inconsistent this year. And last game he had 47 points and he really balled out and he really put the team on his back. So I feel like with the energy and the momentum, you know, carrying on the game three and game four in Memphis, I want to be surprised if they're able to sneak a game. However, I think with Donovan Mitchell coming back, and he being so effective without being 100 percent, I think the Jazz win and, and you know, five, but possibly six if the momentum of the Memphis Grizzlies can win a game at home. Yeah, I think the Grizzlies played such a great game in game one, and maybe that was because Donovan Mitchell was out, but I feel like it's just, I feel like the Grizzlies are maybe win one more game just because of they're such a tough team and they're such a, they're a young team, but they're very explosive and they're very talented. And I feel like they could be a similar team to what the Thunder were, what, five, 10 years ago when they had Russell Westbrook and Kevin Durant. So I think at the same time, I think the Grizzlies maybe win one game, but I mean, it's the Jazz and I feel like the Jazz are going to take this series at least in five or six, somewhere around there. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Let's see the next series, of course. Uh, the Suns and Lakers. That's an interesting series. It's uh, series is tied currently one, one. Um, I think the Lakers are going to end up pulling this out, but what do you think about this series? I had it going seven and my X factor for the Suns was Deandre Ayton. And so far he's playing like the guy I want him to play. I mean, he's shooting over, I think 90% so far in this series. The only reason I feel like the Lakers are going to win though, is because Chris Paul's injury. If Chris Paul was 100%, I really feel like the Lakers would be down 0-2 right now. And it'd be a huge possibility that they lose this series. The Suns are a very good team. And it sucks that, you know, they have to go against the defending champs in round one because this is not the first time Chris Paul has won against the defending champs in round one. He had to go against the Spurs and that won seven games. And then he was banged up for the next series. And it feels like history is just repeating itself. So I think the Lakers are going to end up winning probably in six because of Chris Paul's injury. And unless he gets 100%, because he only played, I think, 25 minutes, and Cameron Payne played the majority of the game. So unless somehow he gets back to at least 80, 90 percent where he's able to be aggressive on offense, the Lakers are going to walk away with the series. And it's sad because the Suns had a real possibility of winning this series because I think their team that can win it all, both Chris Paul being down, I think it really slices down their chances. Yeah, Chris Paul has had a great season, and yeah, it's kind of disappointing what happened. It's similar to what happened a few years ago when he was in Houston. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, they had a 3-2 series lead. He goes down, and they end up losing in seven games. And I think if he would have been a lot more healthy, the Rockets would have beaten the Warriors back in 2018. Yes, they, they so, won in that series. <clears throat> yeah, so it's really disappointing. Um, but I do think – I just think the Lakers somehow are going to at least make the conference finals just because it's LeBron and because mm-hmm. the Lakers, I feel like, didn't really – it felt like there was something off with them the whole year. And, of course, LeBron missing so many games, Anthony Davis not being 100%, but I still think the Lakers, there was something wrong with them. And I think now they're finally getting everything together, similar to what happened in the bubble last year. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, let's go to another series, uh, the three and six right now. You got um, – I'm going blank right now, but the three and six series, uh, let's see. Oh, the uh, Nuggets Denver, and Blazers. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so the Nuggets and Blazers. That series has been interesting. Uh, the Blazers surprisingly game won Game One, uh, mm-hmm. but the Nuggets came back and won Game Two. Uh, who do you have in that series, and what do you think the? Um, do you think that series could go seven? I have uh, Portland in seven. I think both teams do something that the other team can't. So when I look at Denver, I'm looking at Aaron Gordon and Michael Porter Jr. being 6'9", 6'10", and being a very effective on the offensive end. Like Michael Porter Jr. game one was 12 for 21, and all nine of his misses were from the three-point line, you know. So I feel like what they do, being that tall, being scoring forwards, that hurts the Blazers because three of their best players at the end of the game are under 6'5", with Norman Powell, Dame, and CJ. However, Dame and CJ, you know, especially without Murray and Barton, are going to be able to give the opposing backcourt 50 points. And then when I look at the big man matchup between Nurkic and Jokic, Jokic is going to win all day. But if the Blazers want to have a chance, Nurkic has to slow down Jokic. You can't shut him down. Well, you have to slow him down, be physical. That's how he struggled with the Lakers last year in the Western Conference Finals and then from the Blazers, you have to give Jokic in foul trouble. If he's on a court, he's going to pick you apart. But if you give him two quick fouls in the first quarter, you know, three in the second quarter, four in the third, 
you make him play less than 34 minutes because he's on the bench with foul trouble, you have a true chance. I do think the Blazers are going to win. They did what they had to do and win a game one. But if they want to be successful, you know, players are going to have to step up. Rotations are going to have to change and the mindset is going to have to change because the Nuggets, you know, they can still win this series without Barton and without Jamal Murray. They have talented scores, but for me, the Blazers are a better team when they want to be. So I think they're still going to win a seven, but they have to step it up. I do think it's going to be, it's it's already a fun series and I feel mm-hmm. like it's going to be, I mean, I could see this going in seven. I mean, I think I had the Nuggets in six originally, but I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if Portland won, you know, Dame Lillard, in my opinion, is still the best point guard in the league. Ooh. And, um, I don't know. It's just going to be a good series, I feel like. And, of course, Jamal Murray missing or being out for the Nuggets is another big factor as well. Mm-hmm. Um, let's go to the Clippers and Mavericks. I thought the Clippers would win the series in six, but it looks like this could be a quick series. Dallas is already up 2 nothing. What's going on? What, what do you think is wrong with the Clippers right now? I think it's coaching. It's funny how the players want to put the blame on Doc Rivers, but right now my sixes are comfortable 2-0, and and they're down 0-2 after they tanked because they were scared of the Lakers, which we all know. And then they're going against Dallas, and now they're, they're down 0-2. So I think coach is the problem. When I look at Patrick Beverly playing 23 minutes and Rondo playing 19, I think that's a problem. Patrick Beverly plus minus is minus 11, and uh, Rondo is plus 13. Rondo, you brought him in to make everybody around him better throughout the entire game. You know, he had four points, you know, seven assists in 19 minutes. Patrick Beverly's doing nothing out there. He's useless. He's getting destroyed every time he plays Luka. He can't score. There's no reason for him to be playing 20-plus minutes. You brought in Rondo for a reason. Let him get everybody around him better. In the fourth quarter, let him get Paul George. Let him get Kawhi easy shots. So I really blame coaching because I can't blame Kawhi. He had 41 a game, too. I can't blame Paul George. He played great outside of the terrible three-point shooter. I mean, he's shooting less than 25% throughout the series. So I think that has to step it up. But honestly, it's the coaching. The rotations is bad. The matchups is bad. They keep letting Luka do whatever he wants. You know, the role players for the Mavericks are playing way better than the Clippers. So it's coaching. You know, the rotations is bad. And honestly, I ask myself, is the Clippers roster, you know, are, are we giving them too much credit throughout the season? They played good. They were consistent. You know, they were one of the best three-point shooting teams, but so far in the playoffs, they haven't showed up. Yeah, I mean, you said you mentioned Kawhi playing really good. He scored, what, 41 points in game two? 41. And they still can't win. I feel like there's something wrong. I mean, Paul George hasn't been – I don't know how I'd, what I'd rate Paul George. I mean, he's played pretty good. But, I mean, Luka is just dominating the series, and they got to figure out a way to uh, stop him and – and I, as being as a Kawhi Leonard fan, I'm disappointed mm-hmm. because he could end up leaving the Clippers and going to the Warriors or something, which I don't know why he would. But I have crazy predictions for Kawhi is going to go. I have three teams I think that he's he, he's going to look at. I think if they lose, he he might opt out. Well, he's definitely going to opt out. And I'm looking at the Sixers because of the Doc Rivers connection and, you know, the big two that we have. He could replace the Wise Harris. I'm looking at Miami because people don't – he wanted Jimmy Butler before he wanted Paul George. And so I want to be surprised if he goes Miami. And that's a perfect fit. It's a scary fit for the East. And then the last team I'm looking at is the Knicks. They have a lot of money. He has family ties in New York. That's a big market franchise that made the playoffs this year, so they're ahead of the schedule. Him going there changes a lot. So I think he's leaving the Clippers, and he's coming East. That would be interesting to see, and I think he likes California, but again, I think the only team Mm -hmm. that you could really see him going to is maybe the Warriors. I've been hearing a lot of rumors on that, but I'm not Mm -hmm. sure he'd want to go there because it's Steph Curry. It's Steph Curry's team, and he wants to have his own team, and I feel like, yeah, if he went to New York or Miami, I'm not sure if he went to Philly, it would be his team. It probably would be, but Mm -hmm. if he went to those teams, it would be his team. I think that's why a big reason why he went to the Clippers instead of the Lakers because it was his team and not LeBron, so... It's going to be interesting to see. I hope the Clippers win, but I feel like the Mavericks are somehow going to pull this out. Um, I do, who, too. <laughs> do you think the Mavs win in five or six, or do you maybe think maybe Dallas gets the sweep? I don't think they will, but what do you think? I mean, I had the Clippers in six originally because I thought, you know, coaching would be better and the matchups and the rotations would be different. But right now, the Mavericks have complete control. And the thing is, the Mavericks won two games on a row, so now they're going back to Dallas. So all Dallas has to do is win at least one home game. Win at least one and you go up 3-1. If they win game three, it's over. They win game three, it's over. If I'm the Clippers, the Clippers, they have to pull out all the stops in game three if they win a chance. Whoever won games three, that's going to tell me who's going to win the series. I think right now Dallas has control. I want to have faith that the Clippers won in seven, but the Mavericks are looking too good. They're shooting too good from the three-point line. Now, 
you know, the best bet for the Clippers is the Mavericks just not knock down threes because they shot over 50 percent from the three point line in the game, too. So I think, you know, the Clippers, if they do the right things, they could still win the series. But the Mavericks have complete momentum going home. And that's scary. Yeah. And I think, again, yeah, like in this game three is very pivotal. The Clippers need to get a win in order for them to keep this series alive. Mm-hmm. Um, at the end of the day, who's your finals prediction? For both Honest the East and the West. So, at the East, I still think, you know, even though I'm a Sixers fan, diehard Sixers fan, I still think Brooklyn is coming out the East. I just don't know what team is going to be able to stop those three guys. You know, if one player has a bad game, you still have two that can get 40. Two have a bad game, you still have one that can get 60. You know, all three guys, at least one of them is going to be at a court on, be on the court at all times, and that's scary. And so I feel like what Brooklyn is doing, and I don't think Steve Nash gets enough credit for the season he had coaching, because all three of those guys missed a lot of games and he had a lot of different rotations he had to play and they were still successful. So I do feel like that team now has a lot of chemistry. I think they're coming out the East and right now out the West, I think it's still the Lakers. It's still the Lakers. I just don't know if any team's going to be able to beat them. And if they get rolling, then they're going to be able to pick up chemistry, pick up momentum going into the finals. And right now that's, that's my finals matchup because the Clippers are just disappointed right now. If the Suns had healthy Chris Paul, things might be different. But because, you know, all teams are not healthy, the Lakers just look like they're going to walk to the finals, in my opinion. And, um, yeah, I think I got the same reason. I do think the Jazz are better than we think they are. But, again, they're, mm-hmm. I think they're still too young, and I think they're a year or two away. Same. But I do think the Jazz will be very, very good in the next few years, and I think they could at least have at least one finals trip. So I'm mm-hmm. going to probably agree with you there. Brooklyn, I think, is going to easily um, – well, not easily. I mean, I do think Milwaukee and Philly are going to be tough, but they're just so mm-hmm. good with Kevin Durant, Kyrie Irving, James Harden. It's amazing to watch. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, in the West, I'm going to still stick with the Jazz, but I do think mm-hmm. the Lakers are at least making the conference finals. Or I guess I guess the Jazz would play the Lakers in their next matchup. I think, yeah, they would be how. But I do think the Nets are the Jazz are going to win right now, but I still think there is a chance that the Lakers make the conference finals mm-hmm. at least. But we'll see what happens there. Um, I got one more question before we start talking about your podcast. Um, okay. Who do you think? There's um, an interesting award, I think, outside the MVP. I think it's the Rookie of the Year. I think... Mm-hmm. LaMelo Ball is probably going to win it, but he missed some time. And I think Anthony Edwards, during that time when Melo was out, I think there was a good chance that Anthony Edwards gets it. Who do you think wins the Rookie of the Year? For me, I think it's still going to be LaMelo. I think he proved himself so much in that first half of the season. And the fact that you saw the Charlotte Hornets drop off because of his injury, he was a key piece in why they were going to make the playoffs. And I truly believe if he didn't get hurt, they'd be a top six seed. They wouldn't even be in a playing tournament. So I think what he did in that first half of the season – really, you know, solidifies him being rookie of the year. But we have to shout out Anthony Edwards because what he did in that second half of the season, because the Timberwolves to me are just a bad franchise. And I've been waiting them for I've been waiting for him to get big minutes since he was drafted. But they finally gave him big minutes. He had some big time performances. He had a 40 point game where I think he shot like over 70 percent from the three point line, like over 65 some percent from the field. I mean, he had one of the most dominant scoring performance I've seen of all time, let alone from a rookie. I think he closed the gap. And I wouldn't be mad if he won rookie of the year. I just think LaMelo, what he did and his dominance and his overall game and his impact to winning should, you know, solidify him being rookie of the year this year. Yeah, it's been a pretty fun race for the rookie of the year outside the MVP. Mm -hmm. Um, The most improved player of the year was pretty much Julius Randle. The sixth man of the year was pretty much um, Jordan Clarkson. It Mm -hmm. seems like um, Monte Williams is going to win the coach of the year. Even That's a tough one, though. The coach of the year for me is a tough because there's no wrong answer. And every coach has their own storyline. And even there's guys outside of the finals like Doc and like Steve Nash that had great years that are being overlooked because of, quote unquote, you know, star power. But there's a lot of coaches that deserve this award this year, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, I think at first they were saying Quinn Snyder. Um, Mm -hmm. I would have probably agreed with that. But what Tom Thibodeau has done with the Knicks, I think that should be given some consideration. So that's why I would if I had a vote, I would give him the coach of the year. But. I mean, yeah, as you said, mentioned, there's probably five or six coaches. You could even give a word to maybe or consider it to pop Greg Popovich, what he did with the Spurs. I mean, they had nothing really. I mean, DeRozan, they had some pieces there, but they didn't have a lot. And I feel like he's done an excellent job there in San Antonio. It could be his last year, but he's definitely done a nice job in San Antonio with not much talent. Um, as we wrap up, as we wrap up the interview, um, do you want to tell us more about your podcast, where we can get it, all that good stuff? Yes, you can find me on all audio platforms. Forms, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Anchor at Sports Talk with Chris. Sports Talk with Chris. And on my social media is my Instagram and Twitter is Sports W underscore Chris. Sports W underscore Chris. You can also catch me on Facebook where I do live shows at time. 
Sports Talk with Chris Facebook page. Those are all my links and all my social medias. All right. Thanks for coming on, Chris. It's been a uh, pleasure talking. I like talking about the NBA, especially the playoffs. This is definitely when it's, when, when it's the best time. Um, I like everything, but I think the NBA especially is great in the postseason. So, again, thanks for coming on. Again, you can check him on Instagram. Um, you, did you say you were on Twitter as well? Yes, Twitter. Sport, same handle, SportsW underscore Chris. Okay. All right. Thanks for coming on. And had a pleasure talking with you. And I hope to see you in the future. Yeah, same here. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Sports Town Podcast, or the STP Pod for short. If you want to check out more videos of the Sports Town Podcast, click on the left. If you want to subscribe to the channel, click on the right.